Um, so just a little bit about myself beforehand, um, a degree in geography and sociology and a master of regional urban planning from UCD, certificate in SEA, and that's just some of my experience there in the Dublin Transportation Office, which was the predecessor in some way to the, to the NTA and in private sector as well, um, and mainly around the area of uh, strategic transport planning, but also uh, our role in the, the planning process as a prescribed body dealing with uh, local authority plans and programmes and major planning applications. As well as policy guidance development, so really, it's 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 my main my experience that's relevant to here is my um, project managing the last two GDA transport strategies and um, the LS maps as well. So just a quick overview, as as uh, Donald said, there are three of them were published within a few months of each other there at the turn of the year, um, Limerick, Shannon, Waterford, and the Greater Dublin area. But the, the context for the three of them um, varied. So in a way, the, the GDA strategy there is. An element of sort of continuity from historical transport plans. Many of you will have, you know, some of you may have worked on some of these in, in the past as well. The DTI really in 1994 being the first really attempt to sort of a, an integrated transport strategy for, for the whole region, followed by a platform for change in 2001. Transport 21, 2005, kind of more of an investment program um, to an extent. And then in 2011, we did an implementation plan and a, dra a draft transport strategy followed by an implementation plan a few years later. And then 2016, the Greater Dublin Area Transport Strategy, the first one to be formally approved by the Minister for Transport um, under the new act, under the 2009 DTA Act was actually done. So the 2022 one really is the first formal review of a statutory transport plan uh, for the uh, Greater Dublin Area. And that's kind of, um, within each of those kind of plans, there was a changing administrative context. So, you know, some of them were done in collaboration. There were several different agencies and bodies responsible for transport and, you know, uh, whether it was the different operators and uh, the local authorities. But when the NTA was formed in 2009, the intention was that, you know, we would be charged with these transport strategies. Unfortunately, our first one came about uh, at a time when there was a major financial crisis and it wasn't approved. But then that all changed in 2016. Um, Minister Pascal Donoghue, I think, uh, approved the first one. Um, and this one, the 2022 one, was done in December 2022. So that's the, the GDA kind of context. The metropolitan area ones, slightly different. Um, first of all, for the metropolitan areas, which is an issue, in a, a, kind of a, a contrast in itself, rather than a, a greater Dublin area. But they're non-statutory and undertaken much more cooperation with the local authorities. There's much more of a sort of feedback loop and iteration between ourselves and the local authorities when making those ones because we didn't have the powers. So in Cork, we finalised and published in 2020. And the reason that was slightly not a part of this presentation um, is mainly around, it predated the kind of climate action plan, sectoral targets, and really kind of predated, it was the first of the metropolitan area transport strategy. So we were learning, I think if you look at the Limerick one and the water one, there's a bit more of a continuity or a, a kind of a, a similarity between them. And it's, it's a, a more of an established format that you'll probably see in, in the Galway one as well this year. So CMATS, the Cork one will be reviewed uh, starting next year and the year after. Um, the LS maths itself, we commenced that in 2019, WMATS commenced in 2022. They both have finalized at the same time, which tells you a lot about the, the different processes that they went through and experiences. And um, we're the first formal transport strategies for Waterford and Limerick, really, um, published in quarter four, 2022. And of course, as I said, the GMATS is now underway. So I'll start off with the GDA strategy. And I won't, you know, what have discussions here and kind of talk about the issues rather than just going through the, the, for, the, the contents, which you can see anywhere online anyway um but that's kind of the format of the of the strategy so planning for sustainable transport we want to get up front and center you know the the link between land use planning and, and transport and then integration and inclusion really copper fast in the idea that one of the reasons the nta exists is to get that integration across as a as a it's not just separate agencies working in, in transport then we go through all the modes there from walking down to roads and traffic management freight and then a section on climate action management which is, is in fact you know, emerging as obviously the most important matter that we have to deal with. So this part of the presentation, I think we'll, we'll look at the key measures and objectives under each section. Some of these have like 20 something measures in them. I won't go through all of them. We're just starting on, on planning for sustainable transport, how we interact with the land use side of things um, iterates with, with, with transport planning. So the management of transport demand where it's created is the critical element of transport planning in the GDA, where people live, work, go to school and college, is the key determinant of the type of transport system that's required. So the measures that we've brought that we have in this strategy, they're all kind of 
there's nothing new here. Even the 15 minute city, which is a, a tagline that's been around for the last few years, there's nothing particularly new in it that wasn't there and mixed use and everything else. But we felt we had to kind of list out all these different components to say, you know, how do we make sure that we're not creating problems further down the road that we have to address again in the future. So one of those is being like the decide and provide approach to uh, transfer planning in the past, you know, yourself, the, the predict and provide thing where we just forecast, basically forecast car use into the future and provide us road infrastructure on that basis. Now it's a slightly different approach that we'd like to take. And I know a lot of you will be familiar with this and local authorities as well, where we say, look, what's the type of environment we want to have? And if that's a, you know, a fine grained urban in, environment and suburban area where, you know, the roads don't dominate, well, that's what we provide. And in fact, we're going even further. We're taking existing uh, roads and narrowing them and providing, a, you know, knitting together as kind of closer communities and stuff like that, rather than, you know, dual carriageways, et cetera. The road user hierarchy comes into this section, you know, obviously with the pedestrians at the top all the way down to private cars at the bottom. Consolidation of development, again, that's pretty much consolidation development and mixed use development is the 15 minute city concept effectively putting stuff where people are you know it sounds quite basic but that's what it is transit oriented development and more it's it says it's it's called transit oriented development but it's more transport oriented development it's not just about building on rail stations but building in a way that promotes walking and cycling and again filter permeability is a major part of that where you give competitive advantage to the pedestrian and the cyclist as opposed to the car or the public transport as well there's a big section on school planning and design, an area that we've grappled with for many years, but I think, you know, trying to get them located in the right place, design the right way with the right network serving them is a, is a major challenge. I think it's beginning to be seen in, in some of the master plan areas or SDZs where they're really thinking about this, but still, you know, there's a huge legacy in, in that area. And then providing for local transport plans, which are, you know, strategies at the kind of town level rather than the, 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 the regional level. In terms of integration, include like I said, we want to make sure that the reader of this these strategies they, they see straight away how all the things will speak to each other. So all modes and transport schemes, things like park and ride, it's not a panacea for everything. It's not a it's not a you know excuse to kind of continue with sprawl and, and, and rural development, etc. But it is part of addressing the legacy of what's there today is by providing park and ride to intercept people. Um, in their cars on the way into the city before they get there and put them onto sustainable modes and efficient modes. Um, other things that highlight there would be things like the behavior change, which is something that's kind of not always top of the list, but hugely important, hugely effective, smarter travel workplaces and campuses and green schools travel. You know, we, we did the surveys are showing up to an 18% mode, 18% mode shift away from the car a number of years ago under green schools travel on average, which is phenomenal. And uh, when you think about it in, on a kind of regional basis, um, other things like late night transport, walking, cycling at night, issues that are really coming to the fore now with the 24 hour bus services and, and the idea of, you know, the 24 hour cities, etc. cetera, um, how we make obviously provide the services to serve that, but also the environment where it's not dangerous to be walking around at nighttime and, you know, insofar as transport can address those types of issues and things like equality and inclusivity are obviously to the fore now. Uh, the nine different grounds for, for discrimination, how we make sure our transport system, and by system, I mean not just, you know, the bus services and how people are treated on, on trains, but also just the way that the environment is designed. Does it, is it inclusive for all for all users and um, in the way it's kind of functions? So that's just a, a quick graphic of the park and ride strategy. That's them, um, you can see the ring of um, park and ride facilities around the GDA there um, on all the national roads coming into the city. And again, like I said, intercept the car traffic before it hits congestion, but where it does actually meet a high capacity bus or, tra or rail system. So that's being pursued now. They're looking at sites and stuff like that. And uh, hopefully you start to see them come forward uh, in the very near future. In terms of walking, look, walking is not, you know, they're fairly high level measures. We don't have a, a set of footpaths in the strategy that we're going to build or anything like that. Um, but just the principles that uh, in our active travel investment that we look at. So things like junction revisions, removals of slip lanes, tightening turning radii to slow vehicles down, provide additional pedestrian crossing points and changes of traffic signals. And we still have urban areas where there are desire lines not being met and we, we're gonna to seek to meet all those. Support for wayfinding systems and because there's a digital aspect to that as well, integration into journey planning apps. Traffic free streets and town centers where there's benefits to transport and the local economy and local environment. You know, there's a, there's a big push on in certain areas for this type of approach. Um, and yeah, we would support it as long as we can see a, a benefit to it. 
um, and, and it still suits us from a transport point of view. Ensure the needs of all pedestrians, including persons with disabilities, wheelchair users, and people with buggies are met. So, I mean, there's a load, a lot of challenges there, a lot of legacy issues there as well around the quality of footpaths, the width of footpaths, and how we, you know, enforce laws and parking, etc. As well, um, cycling, of course, like this strategy was, you know, it was the first one we produced post COVID, really, and, and developing well, LS maths as well during the pandemic mainly. Um, but we, so you know, there was kind of a what would you say a kind of transition period we're in now coming out of this but like one of the messages out of that pandemic was the growth of the numbers of people cycling but here and internationally and we wanted to build upon that and you know take that momentum forward while we could and the way i put it as well is like you know, the cars all left the spaces for those months and months of, of restrictions and i think we need to ensure that we don't give the space back to them when we when we came out of it and i think we've been you know, there's been major successes in, in the city centre in particular, where we said, look, you know, this left turn lane isn't required anymore. Put in put in some cycling infrastructure or this street in total isn't required anymore, such as Cable Street isn't required for cars. So, you know, I think there's been a bit of a, we fell onto quite a lot and the picture there of the coastal mobility route in Dunleary, you know, a, a brilliant uh, intervention there. That's, um, you know, it was, it was hard to have envisaged that five years ago, to be honest, uh, and it's there now. So, you know, Fair play to the, everyone involved in that one. And so anyway, the cycle measures in the in the, in the strategy, the, the, the cycle network itself was re, re um, reviewed and a new one put together. And um, there's mentioned the cycle manual and stuff like that. And then other policies like, you know, the expansion of the bike share schemes, electrification, that which is already underway, and um, seeking interoperability as well, which is difficult. But I think you know we can look at that as well. Um, e bikes, taking into account e bikes in our kind of planning for like or I'll say this later on as well, what's the market going to be like for, for cycling and where is it going to come from? Um, and things like other emerging personal mobility modes, we have to be aware of them, e-scooters and things like that. So a whole list of uh, measures there that we're implementing under our active travel infrastructure team and elsewhere as part of Plus Connects too, obviously. And um, let's just give you a snapshot of around Blanchardstown. Yeah, it's okay. The red being the primary network, um, the blue being the secondary and the green being the greenways. Um, and that's kind of where we're we're at now with the the network being implemented, and we you now prioritising the red ones as far as as possible. But you can see it's comprehensive, um, for an area like Blanchardstown, which is actually you know, a massive area. You can see that you know you'd hope that like all the schools and everything else are kind of linked up there as well. But that's the kind of outcome of that. In terms of the bus, then the public transport, and this is the real like you know the big ticket stuff that a lot of a lot of focus is on these big ticket modes when you know maybe unfairly in some ways, but um, but obviously Bus Connects is is a major, major public investment program here um, that we're in the middle of rolling out. So the core bus corridor program is in there. The new Dublin area bus network is being implemented and the other measures there, bus stops and shelters and Connecting Ireland. Connecting Ireland is the major rural transport program um, which has been pretty successful so far and it's fairly, you know, there's some significant improvements there and I think there'll be more to come afterwards as well. So, just give you an idea of that you've probably seen a lot of this stuff before, but the one on the left there at the core bus corridor that are going into the board at the moment, we have, I think it's nine have been submitted already. It could be 10 after that. I don't know if the one we did last week, but there's nine there. One of them's already been with the board for a year, so you can understand there's kind of delays there. The top right there is the orbital core, the orbital uh, network itself, and we'll look for priority on those routes insofar as possible. Um, and then the regional court, the regional bus corridors there on the national roads coming in, where we'll also be seeking priority. The bottom graph there is just the transition towards zero emissions by 2035. Um, now that was done a couple of years ago. I don't know how much has changed, but I think you know we're already looking at um, buses coming into Dublin in the next couple of months. That will be electric, fully electric. Athlone got its fully electric uh, bus fleet as well recently. So that's just give you an overview of that. And on light rail, then obviously Metrolink is part of it, and the four Lewis lines you've seen before, Luke and Pulbeck, Bray and Finglas. But this strategy has kind of looked beyond the 20-year program or the 20-year horizon. And some of the analysis we did, and particularly in the context of climate change and things like demand management, there, there will be some bus corridors in the city that we think beyond 2042, we should start preparing for them to be upgraded to Lewis um, along those main corridors. Um, like Clon Griffin was one that was you know, by 2042 is kind of getting towards the kind of uh, numbers that would support Lewis. Similarly, um, I think it was, well, obviously, uh, Sandyford UCD is a major corridor as well, where you can see it moving towards a, a light rail solution as well. 
So the policy on that is we'll, we, we obviously, first thing I should say at the start was that the strategy is reviewed every six years. So in a couple of years time, we'll do the work again and see, you know, it's constantly being monitored to see what the demand is going to be in the future. So we did, we felt it prudent to set that out now that these things could happen beyond even the, the, the time frame for this strategy as well. In terms of DART Plus, you know, there's two railway orders in now, uh, Southwest and uh, West. Also included is the Navin Rail Line, which has been long campaigned for. Um, uh, that, that is now part of the strategy and extension of DART to Kilcock, Nace and Wicklow, and a whole set of new stations to support that. Um, the DART Plus tunnel came down, fell down the hierarchy a little bit in terms of importance. So it's now to preserve and protect an alignment to allow future delivery after 2042. Similar to all the Lewis lines, this will be reviewed again in a few years time and we keep an eye on and keep reviewing it but at the moment it's not the intention to bring that project forward um at the moment and um, that's just the 2042 rail network what's missing there is that there's also a measure for an orbital light rail line um in the period of 2042 but i think it's too early to kind of know where that would be or it could be the old metro west alignment but there's also city edge to, to take account of which is a major development area and um, just in, in you know off the nice road there inside the m50 that may skew demand towards the inside the m50 a bit but it's there and then 2042 is the additional there the corridors i mentioned that could be upgraded to lewis beyond 2042 so that's a kind of the, the rail network that we're, we're planning towards plus some sort of orbital rail line in terms of roads the major um thing there's no significant increase in capacity for private car trips on regular roads in the metropolitan area unless it's for um, safety reasons. Uh, road schemes will be designed for private, for walking, cycling, and public transport. Road space reallocation is really embedded into this, into the roads section as well, which is, uh, you know, a newer enough sort of thing. But the main, well, one of the, <laughs> in the past, this would have been a massive story, but it's not really a story anymore. But the Eastern Bypass has formally dropped now and is not proceeding. We have the South Port access being um, progressed by Dublin Port at the moment. That is part of the strategy, but the bypass itself is no longer there. And the N3 and N4 link, which is kind of the link that would provide resilience to the M50, that's to be looked at again uh, as part of the strategy as well. So the, it's quite clear in the strategy what the function of that road would be is resilience in the event of incidents arising on the M50 and orbital public transport. So there are the two, it's, it's, you know, there are the two reasons you would del deliver this road according to this strategy. In terms of traffic management and travel options, uh, you know, we talk about management of urban centres, including the Dublin City Centre transport study, which has been undertaken at the moment, but all the other type of things that really, um, kind of the local level measures that are required to kind of support, not just support all that stuff in the previous chapters or the previous slides, but, you know, really bring kind of, you know, local level impacts and bring sustainable travel to the level of the town centre and the urban centre, even the housing estates, you know, variable or sorry, reduced speed limits, low traffic neighborhoods and home zones. They're all part of the whole basket of measures to promote sustainable travel. It's not just about big Lewis lines and metros. Things like parking standards are mentioned here, a major demand management measure, um, particularly at destinations, uh, car-free development being supported, management of retail centers. You know, you saw the the hoo over Liffey Valley recently, you know, that was a one of our own recommendations uh, and uh, caused a bit of consternation there. But that's part of it. You know, there's only one or two major town centers in the Dublin area don't have pay parking um, left, uh, that don't implement pay parking. And you have to take into account these electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, etc. Not that we know exactly what autonomous vehicles are going to do in 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 the regional transport strategy, but just to be aware that there, there's there's pushes towards it, and um, it's it's something that could be coming down the line as well that we're not caught out by this sudden thing. Keep an eye on that market and see where it goes. And uh, there's a freight. This is you know it's a major part of it. Um, but uh, one of the biggest things is that reduce emissions. So we're, we're preparing a strategy for same with freight distribution for the GDA. Um, we're looking working with regional assemblies on those as well. Um, looking for locations for freight intensive developments, identifying specific HGV routes, implement the outcomes of the 2040 rail freight strategy and look at consolidation centres. So all those measures to reduce the kind of uh, environmental impact of freight, but also to ensure that it's still efficient and, you know, it's it's being supported properly and not, not being kind of, um, you know, negative impacts may arise from the stuff we're doing, just to make sure that we're, we're, we're not... We're, what we're doing here and um, but again it's been knocked down to another level of strategy making that's been undertaken at the moment 
as well. So I'll just talk a little bit about Limerick and Shannon as well, Limerick, Shannon and Waterford. So just common areas, like I said, we the difference with CMATs and these is that we didn't we didn't have a kind of a, a what's called a, a kind of agreed format for them, but now we do. So you know things like walking cycle network, uh, the bus connects network review and core bus corridors, how we approach roads, parking, freight, and integration. They're all kind of similar to the in the trees, right? Not identical, but they're similar. The structure is similar, and we have a good idea from our experience across the three metric three, three strategies, what we're kind of what works in terms of presentation and policy measures. So that's kind of the main thing. Talking about some specific issues in, in Waterford, the one the biggest issue in Waterford, I think, during the making the strategy was the cross river connectivity. So there was four options presented during the strategy. And I did all the, the assessment that was done um, that the Malta Ferry Bank Crossing and the Outer Orbit Road and Bridge were not proposed for inclusion. Um, and the measure there is in the later stages of the period following the completion of following the completion of substantive public transport elements, the NTA will support the preparation of a study to examine the need for an additional river crossing downstream of the Vice Bridge. So there's a lot of issues wrapped up in that, but I think that was... Uh, it was a major part of the discussion and debates between ourselves, local authorities, and public consultation and elected reps and everything else. But that's the kind of um, outcome of that is that we wouldn't just put in these additional road bridge schemes and that we would try and control and manage the kind of amount of infrastructure provided for that uh, mode. Similarly, in LS Mats, and this was a highly contentious issue, um, I won't forget the, <laughs> like the time it took to kind of get through this kind of issue. Um, it was a long-standing local and regional objective with the second orbital route, um, in addition to the N18M7 Southern route. Phase one was approved and is under construction now. Um, this second phase will provide, provide connectivity to UL Northern Campus, National Technology Park, and uh, the UL Development Lands uh, proposed SDZ. Mainly that connectivity was from Clare itself towards these major um employers and, and attractions in Limerick. It was also Shannon Airport to all so it was a it was a major, it was seen as a major uh infrastructure scheme for in particular for Clare, but also for Limerick as well. We included in the draft LS Mats and the revised draft, but um it was removed under direction from the Minister for Transport quite clearly um last year. He wrote a letter to us and said just take it out. Um, but it does remain a local and regional objective. It is obviously it was in the RESIS, the regional spatial economic strategy, and it's still in the development plans, um, but not in the LS mats. Now I go back to the fact that the LS mats and W mats and C mats aren't statutory documents, but I still think it's a it's a fairly good indicator of where transport policy is going to say if this was taken out. The other major issue in Limerick was the rail network development. So we provided in our first draft for an increase in rail provision based on the analysis we've done. Um, but post consultation, uh, more detailed analysis undertaken based on a more ambitious potential network. So really plug in these things and test them in more detail in your modeling and everything else. The outcome based on the current land use policies was the same. You know, you you know, if you're not changing your land use instead of the start here, it's the primary determinant of transport. You know, you're not going to get a massively different answer. But the long term potential um, for rail development in Limerick was embedded in the in the LS maps by bringing in two phases of development. So phase one, Moira Station, we're pursuing that at the moment. Uh, Bally Simon Station will come later, um, including the potential park and ride there, bus and rail park and ride, and improve frequency on the commuter lines as the demand increases. But the phase two would be that we look at developing land use policies, which focus development in the metropolitan area on the rail network to deliver the trans-oriented development that's required, and then examine the feasibility. But, you know, all rail investment, and the Irish Rail will be very much on board here, would be saying, you know, the all, all island strategic rail review is, is a key document um, and we'd have to whatever the outcome of that is i think ls mats or our approach to the approach of ourselves and irish rail will will reflect what what, what comes out of strategic rail review obviously um but that's kind of the picture of what would could be the potential rail network for for limerick um all the way at the shannon airport um options for bunratty and cratlow or six mile bridge and then um the kind of the old Mungris line and the old Foynes line coming in as passenger services. We are look sorry, I meant to should have said that the passenger the freight line to Foynes is is also, is being looked at at the moment as well. Um so that's kind of the the extent of the suburban network. But one of the issues in Limerick is like the one of the major de development areas here is Mungris, which is down here, which is off the rail network. And of course the SDZ, the proposed SDZ for South Clare is up here again off the rail network. So the there's probably a bit of work to be done to, to support that type of network you're seeing there in terms of land use development. 
So some of the common challenges of the, 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 the transport strategies, you know, boundary issues, contrasting objectives with local authorities, less so in the GDA, because we were able to, with statutory authority to do the strategy ourselves. But, you know, there's definitely times when, you know, either between, there may have been objectives of Cork City that were different to Cork County, similar to Limerick and Clare, nothing, you know, fatal to the strategies. But I think, you know, it can cause um, a challenge when you're making these strategies, particularly as a kind of a neutral body in between. You can kind of have to, you know, work on collaboration between the two of them. So that, that can happen at times. There's inconsistent definition of metropolitan areas. Dublin is 968 kilometers squared. Cork is 833 kilometers squared. I don't need to explain to you that that's, you know, there's 300 and something thousand in one and 1.4 million, 1.2 million in the other. Oh, it is 1.4, sorry. You know, there's there's a lot of rural area in Cork's metropolitan area. Like similarly with Limerick Shannon, there were significant tracts of rural land brought in to incorporate Shannon. You can say right with Shannon, it's a major employment center, it's the airport, it's everything else. It 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 itself performs a very metropolitan function. But you know, with the lands in between, you know, you ended up with these kind of strange outcomes and stuff like that. You end up doing your kind of analysis and you're you're trying to explain to people, oh, the mode share for cycling is 12% or whatever it is. But that's because, you know, half the population is in rural areas in these metropolitan areas. It's difficult, you know. And what does metropolitan actually mean in the sense of, you know, it has to be it's to do with cities. And I think when you over, over kind of, if you draw the boundaries too big, you end up with, it's not coherent enough. I think in particular in Cork, I would say, and I don't know problem saying that the metropolitan area is, is, is very large. And the fact that it's almost comparable to Dublin with a quarter of the population is is definitely something that needs, I would recommend be looked at in terms of urban governance and urban planning and how we do it. But, you know, another thing was like, you know, potential transport strategy hierarchy. We have a little bit of a, what we're trying to get here is, you know, try and get the transport strategy and transport planning really lined up with, with land use planning. So at the moment we have, I don't know how clear it is there, we have the three regional assemblies in Ireland. You've got the Eastern Midlands and Northern and Western and the Southern and Eastern in the blue lines here. And then you have your metropolitan areas um, in red beneath that. At the moment, we have we don't have transport strategies for these for the three regions. Uh, we have metropolitan strategies for four of the five metropolitan areas, but for Dublin, we have this thing called the GDA transport strategy, obviously, which the GDA itself has no meaning anymore in planning other than the GDA transport strategy uh, because we've moved away from those old regional areas. So we would like to see, and underneath that, we have the local transport plans. So it would be nice to see a kind of a recess level transport strategy, a metropolitan area transport strategy, and the local transport plans we're doing in the major settlements beneath that, all lined up and having this proper integration where all agencies can look at, you know, the same level of plan being done for each one and they fit neatly into each other. We did a lot of work with the EMRA on the GDA strategy to ensure the consistency of the two of them. Um, and that's continued on. We have a very good relationship with EMRA built over many years. And, you know, I think if we could do it a bit more of that kind of type of analysis and, and uh, cooperation at all levels. Other issues like other challenges, legacy transport poles and roads, things like the LNDR and the cross river crossings and Waterford, you know, they have to be brought into the, into the process, but they are legacy proposals as the Eastern Bypass was for many years. And we were able to get rid of the Eastern Bypass after many years of including it in transport plans, knowing that it, not being fully comfortable that it was the right thing to do, for example. Um, other things like experience of transport planning among stakeholders, and particularly when we go into the kind of the regional cities where the NTA wouldn't have had the profile that we have in, in the GDA. Was when we, there was like expectations from stakeholders that the transport, like the Limerick, Shannon, Metropolitan Area Transport Strategy would solve all the problems of transport. But, you know, I have to kind of, we have to kind of temper that a little bit. Say, look, we're starting from a low base here where we have to be realistic and and get to a certain place where we can, you know, have a really sustainable transport system here. And then, of course, it's the political stuff, you know, and resistance to change and things like that that got come up as well. Um, but in terms of implementation so far, so far, I mean, we've got the network starting in Dublin. It started back in twenty, I think it was twenty one. We actually started implementing it. We got draft networks for Limerick Court and Galway. Limerick was just uh, they were just published. Recently, we nine of the core bus corridors with on board Panola for Dublin. Options for Cork are being developed now. In terms of rail, now we've got Metrolink Railway Order Lodge a couple of months ago, Dark Plus West and Southwest Lodge, Dark Plus Coastal North as far as Drada went out on display. I think it was the options. Um, and Lewis Fingers, we have a preferred route and we're preparing an EIAR for that. 
In cycling and walking, like, there's just multiple schemes. It's a 350 million euro, 320 million euro a year now. And then just the images there, the Clontarf to Amiens Street, like you're, you're hopefully, <laughs> um, we'll, we'll see that in, in a number of months, like really showing what's capable or capable putting on our radio routes into the city centre and showing what other places could have. And hopefully that will, you know, be used as an example for people to say, this is how good it can be. And it's not the end of the world. If we lose a lane or we lose parking, whatever it is, this is what we need to be doing here for uh, for cycling in the city um, as that changes. So other challenges, land use, the potential there for radical change. I mean, you know, there is resistance, but how, how much are, is the country capable of, you know, moving towards high quality, sort of high density living? You know, we've all seen, we were talking about just before I had about the SHDs and the, the planning system and the planning reforms and that has happened. And, you know, are we really able to end up with a transit transport oriented consolidation of development, uh, high density living and all that stuff? The planning system itself, obviously, is going to happen on board Panala. And, you know, it's a real challenge for us, not just in the transport stuff, but in the land use stuff. You're seeing really good housing development getting delayed and stuff. There's challenges to everything. And, you know, if there's a real, I don't know what the, the I think it's kind of a, a, an inertia. Is just you saw that there was a statistic today that the board got through half as many decisions last year as the year before. You know, these things take time to kind of work themselves out. We had a crisis, but it's taken time, but it's affecting, going back here, it's affecting all those rail schemes and all the bus connect schemes as well. So far reaching implications of that. But the other main thing with land use, the other biggest challenge is the legacy development patterns and serving existing demand. We can build as many as apartments as we want. We can intensify the docklands. We can do city edge. We can do all these things, but it's not going to remove the transport demand from the small towns all over Leinster. It's not going to remove all the transport demand from the one-off housing or the even the, the kind of um, low-density suburbs we've developed over many years. So that's a huge thing. I don't think that's well under, that well understood is that, you know, there's always a focus on the next new area, the next new development, Clonburris, Clongriff and Adamstown. But Adamstown and Clonburris sit next to, to Lucan and there's Blanchardstown and they're, major, they're very car-oriented developments that were built at a time when, you know, car was the, the king and that legacy is very difficult. And that legacy involves trying to get a Lewis there, trying to get a Bus Connects network out there, even getting walking schemes between housing estates out there, knocking through permeability schemes. In terms of cycling, deliverability is a major challenge. The planning process, again, is a challenge. Uh, participation, you know, are we, you know, you have to have some sort of participation, but often, the way it happens now is so um, hostile and aggressive. And, you know, there was a scheme there at somewhere where, you know, they did it in 2013 or 14 and got six submissions on the scheme. And a few years later, I wanted to um, make an amendment. And I thought, oh, Jesus, I think we have to go back out and part eight with that one. And they got 600 submissions, you know, 10 times, or sorry, 100 times as many submissions on pretty much the same scheme. And, you know, that type of difference, like we got over a thousand submissions on the GDA on this strategy. We got 170 on the previous one. There's just way more volume of stuff coming into you. Um, and it's really, it's almost getting to the stage where you're you're questioning that that principle in a way. Like what's, is, it, is it, those six submissions may have been better submissions than all the 600 combined. So it's really uh, difficult to kind of get a handle on how you do it. I think that's happening to, for planners and and project sponsors everywhere. It's just this, the volume, it's social media, it's everything else coming in and saying, you know, get in your submission, blah, 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 get in the campaign. Everything's a campaign. So it just, it's something worth thinking about. Um, the rapid build schemes, like the, getting this stuff down on, on street is probably the, the most important thing we can do. Um, it's really important. And, you know, but they're not, they're not perfect schemes. So we have to look at that as well in terms of cycling. Um, Focusing on key demands versus deliverable schemes. One of the biggest things that really got me is, uh, you know, you look at these local transport plans in towns and often they talk about kilometres of cycle tracks. How many kilometres are you delivered? They were, we'll, we'll stick one on the ring road and we've delivered 12 kilometres of cycle tracks, but they haven't, you know, no one's connected to schools or the housing estates, but they've taken some sort of box. So I think, I think the NTA is very conscious of this and that's something we look at in our planning is like you have to, meet the key demands, not just, you know, deliver meters or kilometers of cycle tracks. Resources and adaptability between ourselves and the NTA, the local authorities, consultancy, you know, how we actually have, to, do we have enough people? Do we have enough people who have experience, et cetera? You know, that, that's all another issue. What will e-bikes deliver in terms of expanding the market and from where will this expansion come? That's a very good 
major point. If e-bikes come in and like, are they converting car trips to bike trips? Are they converting bus trips to car trips? Or are they just converting cycle trips to easier cycle trips? This is something we don't know yet. Um, and we'll, we, you know, obviously we'll have to look into it, but it's something that will emerge in the future. Hopefully there'll be some from car trips, but you know, it's a bit like, uh, you know, when walking versus cycling, one of the key criticisms of our strategies has been kind of, like I said, earlier on the mode shares we come out with. People don't understand why is, you know, why is, I think we'd actually in this strategy, the, the walking mode share went down by 1%. Like that's no good, and you're going well. Let's go to cycling mode share up by eight percent, and you know public transport up by six, and you're going well. It has to come from somewhere, and it's not all going to come from car. Not every sustainable tra- new sustainable transport trip will come from the car. It could be coming from within sustainable transport itself. So it's something that we need to be conscious of as well. In terms of the bus connects, you know, CBCs are now planning. There's a lot of opposition as well, and delays. Delays are a big thing now. Uh, the Clon Griffin scheme was lodged on the. 29th of April last year. It's now May. It's 13 months in with the board. Obviously, we all know about the issues there. The network review implementation, um, we went through absolute like huge amount of consultation on network review. At the implementation stage now, there's still little tweaks that need to be done and things like construction areas, development areas. Some, so there are a lot of challenges there and trying to you know, meet the objective of the network review, but not completely, uh, you know, meet the needs of the new newer communities in these areas but also the existing ones and we're, we're tweaking them as it goes along um, and then providing for it in the planning system as well making sure that the planning developments uh developments in the in the gda don't compromise bus connects and that's that's a one of my key roles as well is to make sure that planning applications do that and uh, metrolink obviously is huge opposition uh, to that and we've gone through many years of kind of tweaking uh, tweaking jesus um making major changes to Metrolink to, to get to a railway order. And the cost is obviously a major thing. And the scale, one of the things with the scale of Metrolink, I, we've never done anything like this before. So I don't think the scale of what it is is understood that well by the public in talking to them. When you talk about, you know, the demolitions required, the sites required, the kind of level of, uh, what's the word, for the level of intervention in the urban landscape in the city centre. You saw Frank McDonald's, piece of a few months ago it will lay waste to central Dublin which is just you know a way of you know click whatever but there is a major impact there um, and I don't think it's understood that well so I think that's something we need to think about as well and how we communicate that I think it's all in hand but it's it's a major part of it um, the timelines for the for the Lewis proposals the long term transition to Lewis on corridors the profile of DAR plus I don't know if this is the case now but certainly I felt like a couple of years ago that like the Dark Plus program isn't, it doesn't seem to get as much traction as, say, Metrolink and stuff like that. It's an absolute game changer for the Western suburbs. Going up to a five minute frequency on these rail lines, massive increase in capacity, as, as revolutionary for the West of Dublin as the Dart itself was for the East in, in 1984 and beyond. And it just, I just maybe I'm wrong, but I, I just don't feel it's getting the same amount of publicity. And it's an enabler of transit oriented development. It's going to make Adamstown work better, Clonborough's work better. Uh, Hansfield, Clon Griffin, all these places that are being, you know, getting that that uplift in service, like a radical uplift in services. Um, but there are the local realities of schemes, level, level crossing closures cause issues, the priority for Dark Plus Tunnel as well, and the implications of the All-Ireland Strategic Rail Review, which is, sorry, that delay there means the delay in it itself caused by Storm not being uh, uh, running but on the implications and are obviously uh, what it means for, for all our, our schemes. But well, going to end on, on climate action management because um, it's all great to have all the infrastructure and everything else, but we're not doing that for fun. Like, I mean, we have to reduce our emissions by 50% by 2030, which, you know, is still kind of something we're grappling with the realities of. So the proportion of travel by sustainable modes and reducing the level of usage of petrol or diesel vehicles, we will need to put in additional demand management measures by 2030 and keep them there to 2050 and beyond. Uh, to achieve that goal so we're in the middle now of doing a demand management strategy and scheme for the for the gda the department are doing things nationally on a national basis um but you know if we implement the full measures set out in the strategy um including some demand management we'll fall to below one percent one megaton of co2 equivalent from a baseline of 3.2 so the strategy will meet that um target but we do have to do a lot by 2030 and it is 2023 now you know, halfway through it. So the issues to consider really, um, and this is for all of us, um, you know, the most important element that requires to be addressed is the long distance travel by, by uh, 
internal combustion engine vehicles. You know, it's it's not about, and one of the issues about electric cars, where you say like a lot of it has been bought, like I've won myself for a few years, a lot of it has been bought by people in urban areas, don't drive that far, don't drive that often. What's, you know, what's the contribution there? It's, it's not huge. It's the long distance ones. And there's this idea that if you have a, a long commute and electric car is not for you, I mean, it's completely the opposite. If you have a 60 kilometer commute, even if it's three days a week or two days a week, it's the most obvious thing to do when you're replacing your car is get an electric car because it's, you're, you're, the amount of you'll save in fuel is, is phenomenal. You know, so I think there's a there's a little bit of a mismatch there or a misunderstanding of, of you know, the, there's range anxiety. Like there isn't really for commuting. Um, the rollout of electric cars themselves, I was talking about there, uh, how we do that and what will we actually reach in electric cars? And then what's the potential for public transport to deliver by 2030 and then to deliver emissions reduction? Like how much can we actually deliver? I've talked about all these schemes. Metro won't be in until 2034, 2035. Um, Lewis Fingers Bus Connect Star Plus, they're all scheduled for 2030 or before 2030. But, you know, we have to think about, you know, with the delays and everything else and, you know, what, how much can we actually deliver by then? HGV technology development is obviously a major part of that. The longest, heaviest vehicles, longest distance, sorry, heaviest vehicles, political win. We've seen already, political will, sorry, congestion charge won't happen in the lifetime of this government. Congestion charge won't happen until Metrolink's built. These sort of statements, you know, brand, okay, well, you know, what do you mean by congestion charge? Is it just the Dublin Canal? Fine, we won't do that, but we'll do something else. You know, they're just, any time they have a chance to kind of push it back, they'll push it back. I think we did a demand management study in the DTO in 2004. You know, all the measures in there are still relevant. It's 20 years ago, and it was pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. Social justice, climate justice, this is a major part of demand management. You know, you have to do it in a way that's fair to, or, you know, to everyone. It has to be, you know, there's a just transition part to this as well. Um, but then again, you talk about electric cars, car dependency is car dependency regardless of the fuel. We were doing demand management. We were looking to reduce the use of the car before we had a climate change emergency or before people were aware of it in the way they are now, you know, it's still, you still cause congestion if you're in an electric car, you still, your parking space on that street is still a parking space on that street, whether you're emitting carbon or not. So it's not the panacea again. So like I said, the national demand management strategy has been undertaken by DOT. We're doing the GDA one on the scheme. So I'll leave it with that real issue. Like, oh, you know, the kind of fundamental issue we're grappling with in transport as in everything else, is the need to reduce emissions. Um, and that's kind of the question there is how will we do that? So I'll leave that over to you and, and thanks for listening and hello to the Q&A, okay, thanks. <laughs>